The story is about a female Army officer who becomes the first woman to join U.S. Navy SEAL training. Even though her bosses doubt her, she surprises everyone by passing the test, while some men drop out. The movie begins with a Senate Armed Services Committee interviewing retired Army officer Theodore Hayes for the position of Secretary of the Navy. The discussion focuses on the limited roles women have in the Navy, and Hayes tries to defend this position. Suddenly, Senator Lillian DeHaven from Texas, who is leading the hearing, interrupts Hayes. She disagrees with his weak defense and argues that the Navy has always treated women poorly. To support her claim, she presents a classified document called the Lark Report and gives copies to everyone in the hearing. The senator continues reading from the report, which includes statements from high-ranking Navy officials who view women soldiers as less capable and make sexist comments. After this explosive hearing, the Navy quickly arranges a private meeting with DeHaven. She agrees and soon meets with officials from the Department of Defense, DOD, in her office. However, the DOD strongly opposes women joining the Navy and has devised a plan to block DeHaven's efforts. They present her with an integration plan that states if a woman trainee can pass any Navy evaluation program, they will allow her to join their ranks. DeHaven realizes it's a trap, as the DOD plans to choose the toughest training program to make the female cadet fail and use her as an example. Still, she agrees, knowing that the publicity from the program will boost her career. Outside the Senate office, DOD officials meet with Hayes to decide which program to assign to DeHaven's female trainee. They choose the U.S. Navy Combined Reconnaissance Team, CRT, a brutal selection course where nearly 60% of candidates quit before the fourth week. The third week, known as Hell Week, is especially tough. The male officials are confident that no woman will last beyond the first week. The scene shifts to a naval satellite monitoring room where topographic analyst Lt. Jordan O'Neill is working to bring a SEAL team home from an active war zone. The control room has lost contact with the team, and one official suggests sending backup, which would take 18 minutes to reach the rescue point. O'Neill, however, suggests changing the pickup location. She explains that the SEAL team, being experienced soldiers, will likely search for a safer way out of the danger zone. Even without direct communication, she believes they should look for a new rescue site. O'Neill quickly analyzes satellite images and identifies a spot that will cut the rescue time in half. Her plan is approved, and after nine minutes, the SEAL team re-establishes contact from the exact location she suggested, avoiding a disaster. Meanwhile, Senator DeHaven and her team review a list of candidates for the Navy CRD program. She rejects a triathlete for being too lean and a powerlifting champion for being too muscular, almost like a man. Senator DeHaven wants the female trainee to have a traditionally feminine appearance to show that any woman can be part of the Navy, without needing to look physically strong. She sets her sights on Lt. Jordan O'Neill, who has impressive credentials as an Olympic triathlon contender and an academic achiever. O'Neill also fits DeHaven's idea of femininity. After a busy day at work, Lt. O'Neill meets her fiancé, Lt. Commander Royce Harper, a Navy operational officer. He congratulates her on handling a tough situation but cautions her not to get too involved, reminding her that she's an intelligence officer, not a soldier. Just then, O'Neill receives an urgent call to meet Senator DeHaven in her office. In the next scene, DeHaven gives O'Neill the papers for the CRD program and explains the significance. If O'Neill passes the training, it could pave the way for women to join the Navy in the future. That night, O'Neill discusses the opportunity with her fiancé, Royce, but he's not enthusiastic. He has concerns about the extreme difficulty of the Navy CRD program, which could result in lasting physical injuries. He also worries that O'Neill will have to share training and living spaces with men who may objectify her, and if she succeeds, she'll be deployed on active duty for an extended period. Royce admits that he may not have the patience to wait for O'Neill if she's away for so long, which deeply hurts her. She feels that her fiancé is doubting both her abilities and their relationship. Determined to prove everyone wrong, O'Neill decides to enlist in the CRD program. A few days later, she arrives at the training center, where the commanding officer assigns her a separate room, away from the male trainees. Word quickly spreads that a woman has joined the program, and the men are not happy. That night, when O'Neill enters the mess hall for dinner, several men mock her and make sexist remarks. The following day, training officially begins, and the commanding officer reminds the trainees that most of them won't last beyond the third week. He then hands them over to Command Master Chief John Urgale, their main training supervisor. Urgale is an intimidating figure who shows no special concern that there's a woman in the group. While inspecting their uniforms, he recites D. H. Lawrence's poem, Self Pity, as a subtle message to the trainees. They should not feel sorry for themselves. 
The training begins with the trainees learning how to carry military-grade boats to the sea and swiftly dismount from them. The rest of the training is brutal, testing their physical endurance. Throughout the punishing exercises, Command Master Chief John Urgale urges the trainees to quit, telling them they can end the suffering by ringing a bell placed at the front of the training yard three times. O'Neill receives no special treatment from Urgale, but she can't escape the sexist comments from the other trainees. The situation becomes even worse at night. The trainees are given only four minutes to eat dinner, forcing them to rush into the kitchen and scramble to get food on their plates. Just as they start eating, the trainers shout at them to return to the training grounds. They have to throw their food into garbage cans and resume training on empty stomachs. This extreme routine carries on into the next day. The hours blur as they are trained to endure freezing seawater, only to be medically evaluated afterward and given the same food they had discarded earlier. It's chaos, but O'Neill sneaks a piece of bread into her pocket and eats whatever cold food she can manage. After dinner, Command Master Chief John orders them to write an essay on why they want to join the U.S. Navy. But the assignment is far from simple, as it comes after hours of grueling physical and mental exhaustion. As the tired and hungry soldiers focus on writing their essays, John plays soothing opera music, hoping to lull them to sleep. Anyone who dozes off will be immediately expelled from the camp. O'Neill, however, takes a bite of the bread she had hidden earlier, which helps her stay awake during this tough test. Fifteen minutes later, John returns to the room and orders everyone back to the training yard to run an obstacle course. This course includes dodging live gunfire. O'Neill is told she will be given a platform to help her jump over several obstacles, but she protests, insisting she wants to be treated like everyone else. However, her complaints are ignored, as the Army's rulebook states that the obstacle height for female cadets should be lower than for males. As the course begins, John watches O'Neill as she refuses to use the platforms and tackles every obstacle just like her male teammates. At the wall climbing station, she goes a step further by helping others climb over the wall by letting them stand on her back. However, despite her efforts to work as a team, her male teammates refuse to pull her up, showing their resentment toward her presence in a traditionally male-dominated space. Meanwhile, the grueling 20-hour days start to take a toll on the soldiers. Many trainees begin to break down, both mentally and physically, and more and more of them quit. To everyone's surprise, O'Neill remains strong and continues to push through the brutal training. Despite making it through the obstacle course, O'Neill is still upset that she was given a platform to make the course easier for her. She tries to talk to the commanding officer about being treated equally, but instead of listening, he makes sexist remarks, clearly showing he dislikes having a woman in the camp. Frustrated by this treatment, O'Neill takes matters into her own hands. She goes to a barber shop and cuts off her hair, shedding her traditionally feminine appearance. She then packs her things from the private room she was assigned and moves into the common hall with the male trainees. Her presence there causes discomfort among the men, especially because she brings tampons, a symbol of her womanhood. However, Command Master Chief John Urgale notices her move and is not pleased with her decision to integrate with the men. The scene suddenly shifts back to Hayes, who has now been elected Secretary of the Navy. He and other officials from the Department of Defense are unhappy with the fact that O'Neill has survived three grueling weeks of training. Even though the program is supposed to be kept secret, her progress has made it to the news, and the public has started calling her G.I. Jane, since her real name hasn't been revealed. Meanwhile, at the training facility, the challenges have become even more extreme, but G.I. Jane continues to push through. In fact, she starts training even harder to prove all the sexist men wrong. As a result, she loses body fat and becomes stronger and more muscular. Outside the camp, news reporters are desperate to get a story on G.I. Jane, the tough woman making headlines for enduring the brutal Navy training. One day, while O'Neill is showering alone, Command Master Chief John Urgale arrives with some news. The senior member of her team has been hospitalized with a fractured leg, making O'Neill the most experienced officer in her group and the new team leader. Meanwhile, DOD officials and Secretary Hayes are growing frustrated with O'Neill's resilience especially since she has survived Hell Week and has been holding her own against the men. They still hope she will quit during the next phase, known as SEER training, which stands for survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. When the SEER training begins, the trainees are dropped from an airplane into an unfamiliar location. Their mission is to reach a target, gather intelligence, and retreat before getting caught. Unlike other drills, SEER simulates real-world scenarios. If trainees ask for early extraction or get caught, they will be treated as real prisoners of war. Unfortunately, during the training, two members of O'Neill's team are captured after refusing to follow her orders. Another member injures his leg, 
while trying to return to safety. When O'Neill attempts to help him, she also gets captured. The officers running the training treat the situation seriously, refusing to assist the injured trainee. Instead, they torture him for information about the whereabouts of the other teams, essentially trying to force them to quit. When it's O'Neill's turn for questioning, Command Master Chief John Urgale is the one interrogating her. With her hands tied behind her back, he starts to beat her mercilessly. When another training officer suggests it's becoming too violent, John simply orders him to leave. He then grabs O'Neill by the head and slams her through a door, before submerging her head in ice-cold water. He tortures her in an attempt to extract information from her teammates about the location of the remaining teams, but O'Neill strongly urges her teammates to stay silent. Taking the torture further, John tries to rip her pants off, claiming this could happen in a real situation. Suddenly, O'Neill fights back, landing a hit between his legs and delivering two powerful kicks to his body. Though John gets back up and knocks her out, he justifies his actions to her teammates by saying he wants O'Neill to understand she's not meant for fighting. In response to his nonsense, O'Neill defiantly tells him to kiss her backside. This sparks cheers from the other male trainees, who join in, hooting at John to kiss their backsides as well. With her determination and spirit, O'Neill transforms the mismatched soldiers into a cohesive team, finally earning John's respect. News of G.I. Jane successfully passing the SEER training reaches Senator DeHaven, who is thrilled. Following her bravery, O'Neill begins to gain respect from her peers, who start treating her as an equal and a friend. However, one day while O'Neill is at the beach with her female friends, someone secretly takes pictures of her. Those pictures are sent to higher-ups leading to questions about her sexual orientation and allegations of her being a homosexual. O'Neill is informed that her pictures with other female officers during training are considered a disgrace to the organization, and she is told she must leave the program while an investigation takes place. She insists on continuing her training, believing someone is trying to sabotage her efforts. However, she learns that once cleared, she would have to start the training over, making all her hard work seem pointless. Frustrated and feeling betrayed, O'Neill rings the bell three times, signaling her voluntary withdrawal from the program. She returns home to her fiancé, who is puzzling news. He reveals that the anonymous photographs were sent from Senator DeHaven's office, the very person who wanted her to succeed to promote women's empowerment. It turns out the senator was using O'Neill to boost her own image. She wanted O'Neill to succeed enough to unsettle her male counterparts, but when O'Neill was on the verge of passing, DeHaven used her as leverage with the Navy to prevent military closures in her home state of Texas. When O'Neill confronts the senator about this, DeHaven feigns ignorance. However, later, she admits to using O'Neill for political gain. Furious at being exploited, O'Neill threatens to expose DeHaven, stating she's not afraid to speak to the press about how the senator used a woman to advance her own career. With renewed determination, O'Neill reports back to training, where she is warmly welcomed by her peers, who respect her even more. As the final phase of training begins, it's interrupted by an emergency requiring immediate support from the CRT trainees. An observation satellite powered by weapons-grade plutonium has crashed in the Libyan desert. A team of U.S. Army Rangers was sent to retrieve it, but their evacuation plan has failed, and the trainees are dispatched to assist in the rescue. During the mission, O'Neill is nearly spotted by a Libyan soldier. To save her, John shoots the soldier, inadvertently blowing their cover. This alerts the Libyan patrol to the presence of U.S. forces, leading to a tense confrontation. John gets separated from his team, and when O'Neill sees the map, she realizes Master Chief is heading in the wrong direction, putting him in serious danger. Taking charge, O'Neill steps up as the leader, showcasing her strategic skills as she and her teammate McCool work to rescue the injured Master Chief from a deadly area filled with explosives. Soon, backup arrives with helicopter gunships, delivering a decisive assault. The rescue mission is a success, and all involved are accepted into the CRT. In the final scene, Command Master John Urgale presents O'Neill with the Navy Cross and a book of poetry containing D.H. Lawrence's poem, Self-Pity, as a token of gratitude for her bravery and accomplishment in saving him and leading the mission. Thanks for watching, and make sure to subscribe so as to watch our latest uploads.